So managing state, it's hard, right? If you've written any anywhere near a complex application, you've quickly figured out that it is really hard to manage your state. And some of the, the React community, even the Angular 2 community, some of the Ember community have started to use a library called Redux. Why? Because it, it, it makes managing your state a lot easier to reason. It makes it simple. Now, it doesn't necessarily make it easy, which there is a difference between simple and easy, um, but it does, it does make it simple and much more easy, uh, excuse me, much easier to reason. But there's one problem with Redux. It doesn't actually do anything to help you with uh, your async code. And that's a problem because async is arguably actually harder. It's a harder problem to solve than, than state management. Uh, particular, particularly if the problem you're trying to solve is just inherently complex. There's just nothing you can do about it. It's, it's just a, a very tough problem. Doing uh, things like parallelism or uh, multiplexed web sockets, they're, they're inherently complex. There's nothing you can do about it. So this talk is going to be about using a library called ArcJS to at least make it manageable. So we, we, there's nothing you can do. It's going to be complex. But let's make it manageable so at least you can understand what's going on and uh, be able to dive your way out. So who am I? I'm Jay Phelps, obviously. Um, that is not the same shirt that I'm wearing right now, even though it looks like it is. <laughs> I just happened to wear another blue shirt. Um, but that's my Twitter picture, just in case anyone hadn't recognized me. Um, obviously, I'm a software engineer here at Netflix. And you can follow me at underscore Jay Phelps. Uh, the regular Jay Phelps is unfortunately a 16-year-old guy who likes to retweet football pictures. And uh, so I always bring that up just because you'd be surprised how often people do tweet him when they mean to tweet me. <laughs> so And and still, uh, Twitter will not give me the, the cool verified badge so that people you know don't accidentally uh, tweet him. So but anyway, let's just dive in. What is Redux? Now, this talk is not going to teach you all about Redux or, or even all about RxJS because both of those things have, are mega talks on their own, numerous talks. But I will give you a, a quick crash course, just so if you have no idea what it is, you at least have a eh, high level idea. So Redux provides predictable state management, and it does so by using things called actions and reducers. So what is this action? It, it's going to describe something that has or should happen, but it doesn't say how. And what I mean by that is if we look at an example of uh, a simple action, this create to do action, you've got the content, you, you know, you, you, you got the intent, you know, you want to create a to do, and you've got the content for that to do, but it doesn't say how you're going to do that. It doesn't say go to the server and and uh, store this in a database or store this in local storage. It has nothing about that. There's no async, async stuff, no, none of the, no side effects. It's completely serializable as an intent. So keep that in mind. What is the reducer? Well, reducers are pure functions, which just means that the, the input that you provide it, every time you provide an input, the same input, the same, excuse me, the same output will always be the same. It's deterministic. It does not have any side effects or any viewable side effects, more importantly. And it, what it does is it takes you, it takes the previous state, it, it's provided the previous state and an action, the current action being dispatched, and then it's expected to return some new state. Now that new state could actually be the exact same state. Like let's say that there's absolutely no changes that need to be made. It just returns the existing state. Basically a no-op. Other time, you may need to do uh, compute some new state. So let's say in this in this very trivial uh, reducer example that you always want to take uh, the action payload and and uh, append it to the existing state. That is another example of a reducer. No real world in the, in the Redux uh, use case is like this this counter. So we basically switch over the action types and whenever I receive an increment, I go ahead and actually increment the state and when I receive a decrement, I decrement it. This is fairly basic. Um, hopefully everyone understands this, but uh, I'm gonna just breeze past it if you don't. So reducers, they handle your state transitions, but they must be done synchronously. And that therein lies the kicker of all this. So that means when I receive that increment, I have to increment it right then and there. I can't debounce this. I can't send something to the server and ask, can I actually increment this or anything like that. It's just, I, I receive that action. I have to do it right then and there. It's all synchronous. 
So what type of async stuff do we commonly do? Why is that a problem? There's a, a bunch of things, right? There's user interactions, keyboard, mouse, uh, mouse movements, and stuff like that. Um, Ajax is probably like the bread and butter of what you all know. You know, we all make Ajaxes, right? Um, timers and web sockets and all sorts of stuff. And this is not an exhaustive list. And, and some of these things can actually be handled synchronously. Even though they are async in nature, the way React and Redux uh, currently are architected, you could handle them synchronously. And what I mean by that is taking a look at this React example, you'll notice that you're packet passing a callback to the on click, which most of you are probably familiar with. And so when that uh, click happens, you go ahead and just synchronously dispatch that that increment, and, and the, the reducer will pick that up and will do the increment, and all, all is happy, right? Technically speaking, this is async, but you're handling it in a synchronous way. Why? Because React is actually abstracting and handling the asynchronousy for you. Now, it is a problem, though, because what if you, want, again, what if you wanted to debounce this? What if every time someone clicks that button, you didn't want it to actually increment right then and there. You wanted to wait a period of time, and then if, if they haven't clicked again, then increment it. You know? Or throttle. There's, different, there's different, uh, different ways of doing it. So sometimes you need more control, is my point. And the, some of the things you need more control on is Ajax cancellation or composition. Composition meaning, like, as an example, if you, uh, you make one Ajax request, and you need to make another Ajax request using the uh, response of the first one, and so on and so forth. Um, doing uh, denouncing or buffering and those type of things, uh, basically manipulating time, uh, drag and drop in web sockets. So in the Redux world, commonly, or excuse me, most commonly, people use middleware for this. And, and the piece of middleware basically sits between your application and the Redux store. So any of the, the actions that you dispatch will go through and the middleware either before or after they reach the reducer. It's completely up to the middleware to decide in, in which, which order they happen. And a lot of these existing middleware use callbacks and promises to, to uh, give you that ability to do uh, more complex async stuff. So let's, let's take a look at these two options, these, these two most popular ones. Callbacks, um, the, Almost everyone should be familiar with them because they're the most primitive way in JavaScript to, to handle asynchronousy. And um, it looks something like this. You, know, you, you call a function, passing in a callback, and uh, when that data comes back, you're going to receive the data or an error, and then, boom, you can do your work. Now, there's lots of problems with callback, but I'll point out one in particular, and that's callback hell. right? Uh, especially Node programmers, if there's any Node people in the room, you've all experienced this. And, and that's that, you know, when you want to chain, you want to do something async, and then when that's done, do something else async, whether it uses the next one or not. You want to sequentially uh, do them, or even more complex with callbacks. What if you wanted to do them in parallel? And then when they're together, like when they all finish, then do something else. Like it, things become very complicated, right? And uh, my colleague, uh, Ben Lash, likes to call this the, the flying V because it's, you know, it sweeps out more horizontally, just like uh, the, the mighty ducks. So there's a solution that was created called Promises to try and resolve some of those uh, issues. And with a promise, there's a neat trick that uh, some people don't actually know. And it's, it's that when you provide your callback to your, to your promise, if you return yet another promise, you can then chain them horizontally. So here we, we fetched the data for the, for the given ID, and then we fetched some more data with the parent ID, returning that new promise. Which that that's what lets us uh, do the the horizontal style of composition, and so once you understand that pattern, this is a lot easier to read. It's pretty good. I mean, so this is a really good candidate to look at. So let's 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 dive a little closer to, to promises. They've got a guaranteed future, which means once you make that promise and it's going to go do what it's going to do, there's nothing you can do to stop it. <laughs> it will do it no matter what. So it'll either succeed and, and call the success callback, or it will fail and call the fail callback. There is no cancellation. Um, so they are immutable. They represent a single value, and they have inherent caching. They, you know, so if you if you create the promise and then then uh, then listen to it multiple times, you'll get the same value each time instead of making multiple requests with the same promise. So th there's. In real-world applications, we quickly discovered that there's two problems with some of these things, that the guaranteed future and uh, the single value. 
So let's take a look at the first one, that guaranteed future. And again, remember, promises cannot be canceled. Why would I ever want to cancel a promise? Why would I, why would I make a request? Why would I want to cancel it? Well, there's, there's lots of reasons, but let's, let's look at a couple of the most common. Uh, changing routes or views. Imagine that you, you mount some component. You, let's say you're using React Router or something. You mount, mount a component, uh, and then on component will mount or component did mount, you go off and fetch some Ajax request. And then before that request is finished, someone changes the route. Someone transitions away, hits the back button, goes somewhere else. You can't cancel that request. So what are you going to do? You have to handle that in some way because you cannot cancel it. There's the autocomplete use case, which I'll elaborate a little bit more in the future. Or, or you know, the simple one like the user wants you to. Like you're making some request and you want some button to let you to let the user actually cancel the request that, that is going out. First, I'm just going to give a little demo of, of the first use case, just so we, we all are on the same page and understand it. And I'm going to do it in the context of Netflix's member homepage. So if you, uh, how many of you are Netflix users? OK, nearly everyone. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're the reason I have a job. So, um, so let's say that you know, I, you know, I log into Netflix. I'm a big fan of Daredevil. So um, you know, I, I go and, I, and I'm like, oh, I want to watch Daredevil. So I click on that. <coughs> now, when I do that, immediately when I start clicking that, let's say I make an Ajax request to get Daredevil. Now, again, all of this is not, I'm not going, this is, I'm not explaining the architecture that Netflix uses. This is just a hypothetical example. <laughs> so if there are any people in the room who work on this particular UI, forgive me. But let's say I, I you know, I make that request to go, to go get Daredevil. But then I decide, while that's still going on, I've got a really fast brain, and I decide, I don't want to watch Daredevil. I'm sick of Daredevil. So what I do is I, I go back. And I decide, no, nah, the get down. No one wants the get down. Now notice, I didn't cancel my Daredevil. The Daredevil Ajax request is still out, uh, going out. So I've got code that's waiting for that request to come back. When that request does come back, what are you supposed to do? Not only is the JavaScript that it's, it presumably you're sending JSON, but there'll be the, the JSON parse, so there'll be some CPU cycles eaten up on that. Um, and, and not just that, you have to handle that in some way. Uh, so if, if that component has already been unmounted, if you don't, you, you have to have some sort of uh, bit that you store that says like is unmounted, then ignore the response. So like when you come back for the, from the, the promise, you, you know, you'll say if is unmounted or not, then just don't do anything and just throw the promise away, which is not ergonomic at all. And, and also a waste of CPU resources, particularly if you're on a, a very low powered device, right? So what we want to do is, is we want to come here, we want to select our, our Daredevil, make our request, say I'm going to go back, and when I do, it immediately cancels that request, because I no longer care about it. And when you cancel it, that means that your, your handlers no longer need to, to worry about state, like maintain some arbitrary state of like, ignore, don't you know, pretend the, the man behind the curtain's not there type of thing. So I can safely make that new get down request, and everything will be hunky dory and peachy. That's the that's the, the the problem and the solution. So I bring this up and stress it because canceling is is very common, needing to do cancellation, and it's really often overlooked. I don't know how many times I've looked at people's apps. They've asked me, "Hey, can you can you audit my app?" And one of the first things I do is I look for async stuff, and I look for places in which they don't handle the case of cancellation. So I try, I go into places that will do Ajax stuff, and then I'll immediately leave and go somewhere else and, and switch pages or click buttons and do all sorts of things. And, and their app will often get in really obscure states. And when they get in these really obscure states, it's really hard to, to diagnose that, right? So you get a report from CS, from your tier three or your support, and they're describing the problem, and you're just like, how? I don't understand how they got in that. And you, as just a normal developer who knows how things work in your app because you wrote it, go back and try and recreate it, good luck, you know, because it was like a series of steps and you had to erase it. That's the key, it's a race. So it's bad, we need to fix that somehow. So the other thing about promises is the single value. And this isn't as big a deal because a, a lot of the stuff that most people's apps do is single value. So for example, Ajax, you know, it's the only one of these four things that is a single value. It's request response. You only, you know, you have one single value. And so that's not 
the end of the world for, for promises, but there are a lot of things that people want to do that are more than that, particularly around uh, user interactions, like, like debouncing and stuff like that, and web sockets, for me at least. So what do we do? What do we use to solve this problem? What we used are observables. And what is an observable? If, you, uh, if you've never heard of them before, I'm going to very quickly go through this. It's a stream of zero, one, or more values. So keep that in mind. Zero, one, or more. Zero meaning you could literally have no value, and that's okay. It just completes. We have one value, just like you know, like a like a like a promise does. We can have more values, and those more values are over a series of time. That new dimension is what's really important about uh, observables compared to promises. But over time, it's a stream of things happening. And we get the cancellation, the thing that we really were looking for in that last demo. So they are uh, streams are a set with a dimension of time. One, one cool thing is that they're actually being standardized right now. So they may actually land in the native browser without a library. Um, don't hold your breath, you know, who knows uh, how that's going to go, but it's very possible. Just like the promise, promise went down the standards track, observables are going down there as well. Now, they aren't in the browser today, so what do you use? Well, you use RxJS, which is a reference implementation of that, of that specification. And on top of that, it provides some custom stuff on top of it, operators and uh, uh, factories for creating uh, different types of observables, and I'll touch on it a little bit. But my, my colleague, uh, Ben Lesh, likes to call this Lodash for async, um, mainly just because it's a utility library, but where where Lodash is is just like basically you have you have you give it an in, it gets an out. This is like you give it an in, you give it out, but it's over time. So you have multiple values, and you so um, let's, let's dive a little bit deeper with that crash course. So creating observables, there's lots of ways to do it. This is not a talk about like I'm going to teach you and make you an RX master. So if you get completely lost, it's totally okay. Um, these are creating some of the, the simple primitive values, like an observable of one item, an observable from an array of items, setting an interval, um, or making AJAX requests or WebSockets. And there's a bunch of ways you can create completely custom observables as well, which is common. These observables you, you subscribe to. And you subscribe to them not too dissimilar to how you would then a promise. So you can actually provide two functions, the first one being the next function is what they call it, which is sort of like a promise, like the, 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 call, the success callback, except for because this is over time and it can be zero or more values, that next function could be called n number of times. It could be called thousands of times or it could be never called. It depends on how many times that observable emits something. And then there's the error callback. And then there's one more path, which is complete. Because we have uh, time, we, we sometimes it's useful, not often, but sometimes it's useful to know when this thing actually is done, when it completely completes, there's nothing more. So that's the basic primitive of, of an observable. What can we do with these? Well, well, they can be transformed. Just like I was talking about with Lodash, we can map, filter, and reduce these things. But we're not just doing it on a single item. We're doing it over the stream. We're stream processing. So as something comes in, we'll map that to something else. And we'll do it in a very efficient way. So we're not creating intermediate arrays and things like that. We're doing it very, very efficiently. Observables can be combined. We can concat them and merge them and do all sorts of cool stuff with them. And because they have a time dimension, we can very trivially, very trivially, do debouncing and, and buffering and throttling. Like, so trivially, it's like deceptive. And for, for good measure and a bonus, the observables are also lazy typically, which means it's very easy to retry and repeat them because they, they you basically build up a, a definition of what the observable should do, but it doesn't do anything until someone subscribes to it. It's lazy. And so it makes it really easy to retry on an error or on some other condition or to repeat it, like to say, make this HX call five times. So if you're not getting it yet, observables can basically represent just about anything when you have all of those dimensions. Uh, we don't recommend you do that. We actually do that. You don't Rx all the things, you know, so write your entire application in Rx. You can do it. But the real problem, it's not that it's bad. It's that Rx is so new that it's, you're being kind of a sadist. You're like, you're, cause uh, anyone else who comes along is going to have to like really learn Rx really, 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 cause 
if you can't, you can't figure out any of your app. So be careful, you know, it's great power, great responsibility and all that. So we really liked Rx and we really, really liked Redux. So we thought, let's combine these two things somehow. Somehow, let's, so we experimented with some patterns and we came up with a solution that we thought was rock solid. We thought, we went through a couple iterations, but we finally figured out something we thought was rock solid. And if you've ever open sourced something, the most important thing, this is the most important thing, is you create a good logo first. <laughs> don't write tests. Don't, don't even make it work. Don't write documentation. Make a good logo. It's the most important thing. It's how you get stars. And that's what's important, right? How many stars you got? So what we did is we looked at the RxJS logo, and then we looked at the Redux logo. Well, we tried to look at the Redux logo, but it turns out Redux actually did not have a logo at the time. <laughs> so we're like, huh, we want to combine the RxJS logo and, and the Redux logo, but the Redux, Redux doesn't have an, a, a logo. So my buddy Ben, he is an artist as well as an engineer. He threw together a sketch of three ducks because we always thought Redux sounded like three ducks. Like it was kind of our internal joke. And thankfully it's kind of caught on and a bunch of people now believe the same thing. So we, he, he created that, that illustration and we pitched it to them. And although they thought it was funny, they did not accept it. And so we said, well, what can we do? How can we, how can we, we really like, and we like the idea of three ducks. And again, Redux did not have a logo. So we thought, we'll take, we'll take a duck, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll kind of smash it around, do some crazy things, right? You know, just kind of play it around. And then we're going to whip the RxJS logo on top of it, right? And then we bake it in an oven, and, and this is what we came up with. <laughs> so, and I, and, I, and I love this logo. I love it because it's got the color and the, the flavor and the, the feeling of RxJS, but it's got the three ducks. <laughs> really important. And if you'll notice, it's very, it's, it, the, the symbol means something. The fact that the ducks are positioned the way they are, um, you know, because it's streams. RxJS, this, uh, Redux, this library is all about the input of one is an output of another. So there was one thing, though, I was staring at this and I was like, there's one thing that's missing. There's one thing that's missing about this, and that is that it needs to rotate. <laughs> Just to give it that extra pizzazz. So this is Redux Observable is what we ended up calling it, which is kind of a boring name for that logo. But Redux Observable is a library, and it's, it's a, uh, a middleware for Redux for managing your side effects, including async stuff. And we do it using something called an epic, which is a pretty epic word, right? You know, So we, it's something we coined that's similar to a saga, if you're familiar with the term, but it's not the same, and so we wanted to differentiate ourselves. Um, and it's just a function that, that takes a stream of all the actions that your application dispatches, and then it's expected to return a new stream of actions that then that epic wants to dispatch. So new actions. So you, uh, excuse me. So you've got actions in, and then you want to dispatch other actions out. Other actions. And so I'll, I'll kind of get your foot wet in this idea very slowly. Here's a very imperative example. This is not an epic. But it's a pseudocode to get, get you the idea of the principle. So we've got this function, ping pong. So imagine that this middleware called this function every time you dispatched an action, and it provided it with that action. And so in here, you could say, mm, does that action type equal ping? If it does, I want to return a new action called pong. And if so, let's just say this hypothetical middleware. If you return something, we will go ahead and dispatch what you return. Following? So pretty simple. You dispatch ping, it'll immediately dispatch pong. In the RxJS world, however, it's much more declarative. We use things called operators. And so this is what it would, would typically look like. Now, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the function with the explicit return, so I'm going to go ahead and quickly switch that to using arrow functions with the implicit. So hopefully everyone is on board um, and understanding what this is. But this is, a, this is a ping pong epic, the most simple epic in the world. It takes a stream, that's that first action, uh, excuse me, first argument, the stream of actions, and then it, you match uh, of type ping. And when that matches, if that, is con if that filter is true, then you're going to go ahead and map that to a new action called pong. And we're implicitly returning this stream, so it will, the middleware will subscribe to this and keep track of that. So it will basically, this is basically just setting up the pipes 
So you've got the pipe of the actions observable. When any new actions come in, they go through here, and if they match ping, then they will be the uh, new action of Paul will be dispatched. Okay. So this is so contrived, right? So contrived. Now let's do a little bit less contrived. We'll, so is we'll, this thing called every time a new element of that stream appears? A new element. So th this is actually a factory that that's called once. So it's called during the application setup because of the way RxJS works. This is called one time when your application boots, which sets up the pipes, the RxJS pipes, and so then action then uh, data is actually pumped through these things under the hood. This code you're seeing right here actually only executes once, but then internal logic to RxJS. Whatever this factory creates, that thing, probably a function of some kind, is called whenever a new element arrives on this stream, this action stream. Because you have a stream of actions here, right? Yep. I could have five of them. Yep. And they could be showing up in any order. Yep. So then if any of them show up, this is then called and he does whatever he does. Yeah, exactly. So all the actions go through here. All the even the actions that you dispatch. So it, my pong action will actually also almost recur, like basically recursively pipe through this as well. It'll go through that action stream, but it doesn't match ping. So it just basically just gets thrown away because you're not looking for it. It will still, however, reach your reducers. So going back to this, let, let's 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 make this a little bit more interesting. What if I wanted to, when someone dispatches ping, I want to wait a second and then dispatch the pong, right? So ping, pong, ping, pong, right? Well, you can do that trivially with RxJS by just adding a delay operator. <coughs> delay is built into RxJS, and so I can just say delay, 1,000 milliseconds, done, and it, and it will work. I can throw together a really quick reducer, so anytime, anytime we're pinging, it's true, and anytime we're ponging, it's false, and this is what it would look like in your app. You, you, you start the ping, it's true, and then a second later, it turns back to false. Pretty simple, right? Let's look at another example, debouncing. Debouncing a, a, an increment and decrement uh, button. So we've got the, that uh, counter reducer that I showed earlier that's pretty basic. What if I wanted to, to debounce that then? I would, I would instead, of, instead of having your application uh, emit the increment uh, action directly, they, they'd instead dispatch increment uh, debounced. That way, you're, not only does the app know that this is about to be debounced, but that way your epics can then listen for that. Then they can use the ArcJS operator debounce time to debounce them one second, and then then it gets uh, the increment uh, type action gets dispatched. Same thing with decrement, just inverted. You know, decrement debounced. Wait a second. Decrement. How that would look in an app is very simple. You click in the button. It's waiting for a second, and then it's updating. So these are these are obviously very contrived examples, right? Because I'm in a talk and it's 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 tough to explain. Now I'm going to do something a little dangerous, though. I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm gonna, I am going to show you some very non-trivial examples. Chances are good you will not be able to read the code, which is fun. The point of these examples I'll show is that Arch, this ArcJS and Redux Observable shine the most in the most complicated uh, use cases. Things that are simple. It, they're great. It's, it's, it, is, it is awesome if you know Rx, but it shines the most in complicated scenarios. So let's take a look at some. Looking at autocomplete first. This is how you would do it in just plain JavaScript. It's you know it's not that bad. It's it's not you know amazing, but it's not that bad for 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 uh, your your autocomplete. So uh, you know the main thing is we if, if another request comes we want to abort the previous one so we have to store that XHR the previous one and make sure to abort it if another one's coming and and uh, do debouncing and stuff like that. So it's yeah, it's not that bad. But what can we do with an epic? We can do the exact same thing with an epic, with just a couple lines of code. And it, and once you're familiar with RxJS or if you're already familiar with it, this is very readable for RxJS people. Like this is very, very readable and understandable and very flexible. So we're uh, debouncing it for 500 milliseconds and then switch mapping that to uh, our AJAX request. And then when the AJAX request comes back, we map the result of that to an action, uh, the query fulfilled action, which will get sent over to our reducers when it's done. Pretty straightforward. Adding air, adding air cancelling, or excuse me, air handling is just as easy as adding a catch operator that's provided by RxJS. So whenever there's an air, you'll take that air payload and you can transform that into an action that, that you can send over to your reducers, query rejected with the air, and it can display that all, all 
pretty simply. Cancellation, there's two different kinds of cancellation. If you're an RxJS person already, you might have caught one of them, which is I'm using switch map here. And in switch map, it's an implicit cancellation, which means if if another, in this case, if another action, excuse me, if another query is requested and it gets to that point and the, the Ajax call inside of it has not finished, it will cancel it. It will cancel that Ajax and then start the new one. It's just, it's very implicit. And you can opt into that. There's, uh, if you don't want that behavior, you can turn that, you can use a different operator, but there's the implicit cancellation. But what if I want explicit? What if I don't want to have, what if like I'm leaving the route and I want to cancel it then? So I'm not sending another query. I'm just leaving the route, but I want to cancel it. We can do that with take it till, which is another RxJS operator. So we're saying take this result until I match a, an action of cancel query. So if my application anywhere, Dispatches cancel query, boom, Ajax is canceled. Now it doesn't cancel all of it, it doesn't cancel your epic. So your epic will continue to listen for queries. So if you need to query later, you can do so. So there are probably some RxJ, I'm hoping there are some RxJS users out here. And if you are, you're probably thinking this is great, but this, you said non trivial examples. This isn't that non trivial if you know RxJS, right? So what can I do to show you some really non-trivial examples, like really push the boundaries? Well, what about bidirectional multiplexed web sockets? How about that? With, with automatic reconnect when the internet goes out and all sorts of bells and whistles. And you mean, it, it, this is not contrived. This is, this is something that I've had to write in so many apps in my lifetime. Uh, not everyone will, but uh, particularly at larger co companies, this is a very common thing. Doing it in JavaScript, good luck reading it is a lot of code. And uh, with a lot of code comes a lot of possible bugs, comes more tests because you're not really, because you're not using a library and, and and there's just a lot of code. It's 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 really hard. I I pity the person who has to maintain this. Even if it was just me, I pity myself. <laughs> so so it's just too much code. But as an epic, I can actually fit all this code and you can read it. You may not understand it, which is fine, but you can read all of this code here. And it's doing the exact same thing. We're doing all of our multiplexing. We're retrying when, when, uh, when the navigator goes online or offline. We're waiting a second and then retrying it when it goes back online. There's cancellation. Um, and you can do multiplexing and all sorts of stuff. And every time the, the, the stock ticker comes back, we dispatch that action. All of this encapsulated in a very nice declarative fashion. If this is all voodoo, it totally is if you don't know RxJS. But the point was just to show that you can make things that are much more declarative once you learn RxJS. So let's let's summarize some things uh, real quick here. So it's get, our, uh, Redux Observer is going to make it much easier to compose and control complex async tasks. And, and I want to stress complex. Sure, learning RxJS just to make request response AJAX calls probably overkill. Maybe not, but probably. So we're not necessarily advocating for that. If you know RxJS or just want to learn it, it is awesome for that, but probably overkill. And uh, if you are an RxJS user, you'd be happy to know that we manage the, the, the framework manages your subscriptions. You don't. So if you're doing idiomatic RxJS, um, you'll never use subscribe or unsubscribe in any of your epics. We will manage the lifecycle for you. And you can use Redux tooling. So because you're dealing with actions, all those actions show up in Redux and you can do time traveling. You have to be careful when you do that because you're dealing with side effects. So you don't want to accidentally be sending Ajax calls that you don't want and stuff like that. But it all keeps it theoretically possible and, and, uh, and, and nice in practice. Now, anytime anyone introduces anything or, or pitches something, there's always a but. There's always a but. Even if they don't tell you about it, there's a but, right? And that's what I was alluding to earlier, is that you should probably know Redux and RxJS before you even attempt to use Redux Observable. Now, if, you're, if, there, if this is just a spare time thing, and you, you're, you really like to challenge yourself, if you're like me, who likes to like get way over my head and dig your way out, by all means, do it. I, I don't want to discourage you. I just don't want a bunch of people feeling like I'm sitting here saying, everyone in this room should use Redux Observable. Don't matter how small or how simple your app is. Um, but if you feel like the problems I described today are the type of problems you solve a lot, and you're willing to learn RxJS and Redux, it's probably a good thing to look into. And on the note of, of RxJS, RxJS does 
uh, I, I will admit that it has a bit of a learning curve. And, and that's because of something called reactive programming, which is the new buzzword of what RxJS is really doing. It's, it's a paradigm that it, it's kind of hard to grok your brain around, but you're declaring what you're going, like the transformations in which you should do, but nothing's happening right then and there. Your, there that, your epic, for example, is set up and you've, you've basically installed all the pipes but there's no water running through those pipes yet until until a future point. And then when someone dispatches an action, then a trickle of water goes through, and then you, the, that uh, that uh, infrastructure you set up gets processed. So it's a different type of uh, of uh, programming style called reactive programming. And so now would be a good time to to uh, introduce. Um, he's not going to come up. I hope. Stay down. Uh, my, my co-author of this, which is Ben Lesh, who's an incredible guy. And just happens to be also the the, the project lead of RxJS. So <laughs> the, the latest RxJS version five was rewritten from the ground up here at Netflix, and he led that effort. And so if you have really tough questions or complaints, direct them to him. He's here. <laughs> so thank you, Ben, for all the work you've been done, you've done, and for all of this inspiration. So I really appreciate it. If this is interesting to you, you can go take take a look at uh, Redux Observable on our website. Um, little shout out here. These are some some of the companies that are actually that we know of at least that are using Redux Observable already. It's brand new, and people are already adopting it. Mainly, mainly being used right now for the really complicated problems. Um, Slack, they're, they're using it for their Electron app that they just recently sh are shipping to to all of their customers. Um, Facebook's open source project Nuclide, which is a, an IDE on top of Atom, um, also heavily heavily uses Redux Observable, and they've been thoroughly uh, happy with it. Food Code Camp and and uh, Wrangle IO and a bunch of others. So, and a lot of these guys have actually contributed back as well. So it's been a really great experience. So if anyone has any questions, I don't believe we're going to open it up, but uh, I'll be here afterwards. Absolutely, feel free to come bug me or bug Ben Lesh. So, but that's all I have for today. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was super awesome.